Hello, I'm Kurt Lidke, board chair for Klamath Film, and you just watched This Is Their Land, a narrative short film about the Modoc Wars of the 1870s, shot on location where those historic oh, wow. events actually happened. With us is several members of the crew that helped bring this extraordinary film together. Uh, if everyone could please introduce themselves and their role on the film. Hi, I'm Michael O'Leary. I wrote and directed the film. Hi, I'm Roman Saragossa. I'm one of the producers. Hi, I'm Theo Bocara. I am also one of the producers. Hi, I'm Madeline Paley, and I am the final producer. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is a film that, full disclosure, Klamath Film helped uh, with in terms of um, location scouting and some other work to make this all, all come together. But uh, how did the concept for a film about the Modoc Wars of the 1870s begin? So I, I have an uncle who's kind of a wild explorer and he likes to try and find cool places to go. And he came back to my house one day and he's talking about like, I went to this cave and there's ice in it and I saw bones in the bottom. And I'm like, I wanna know what that is. Um, and uh, so I went up to Lava Beds National Monument when I was maybe 12, 13. Um, I went up there uh, and I'm just kind of a history nerd in general. And so my sister just wants to go in all the caves and I'm just like, I want to go on this walk through Captain Jack's stronghold and figure out what this is. Um, so I kind of got drawn to the land first and then got to kind of show up and, and see this very unique landscape that you can't really find in the rest of California. I know it's on the you know Oregon, California border, but it's just a really incredibly unique landscape. And when you walk through Captain Jack's stronghold and Lava Beds National Monument, you can really kind of picture what happened there <laughs> as you read about it. And I don't know. I, I I read this story of Jack being, you know, humiliated up on the rock and and forced into this plan. And I just was like, that's a movie. <laughs> um, and it's kind of, I don't know, nagged at me, I guess is the right word for a long time. Um, I think like the first draft of this is like eight years ago. And I thought it was a feature. And I was like, it's got to be a feature. And uh, when we were making our our thesis film in college, I was like, Maybe it works within a 15 minute format if you just focus on these peace negotiations and you kind of focus on, you know, humanizing and understanding the struggle from the Modoc point of view, partially because, you know, this massacre was used to vilify the Modoc for most of history, um, you know, until Custer's uh, massacre at Bighorn, you know, you don't really have a more notorious event in Native and American relations. And so I thought, you know, I wanted to try and come into this movie and make a story about Jack and the Modoc, where we kind of see from their perspective how this change is occurring and all the forces they're fighting against. So this film was a, uh, I believe, a senior thesis for all of you. So that this was a, a college student film, correct? Yeah. So, so how did everyone else get involved in this group project? <laughs> Um, I guess I'll start that one. Um, I have an interesting journey with going back to college during the pandemic because I never finished. Uh, and so I, I took three years off and I went back and it was the fall of 2020. And I was thrown into this group that have been together for, you know, three plus years. And so they all know each other really well. And I'm just like sitting in the corner in the zoom, you know, and, and, and trying to, uh, you know, trying to get to know these other students. And, um, and then they were pitching their, uh, their scripts just to see if they're going to be chosen for the scene of thesis project. And Michael pitched, um, this is their land. And I was, you know, automatically intrigued. You know, I, um, I, I'm of mixed race. I am of Akuma Otham, Mexican, Japanese, and Taiwanese descent. And so when I see a story that is, uh, about, you know, uh, native history or na native people, I, I always get really interested in it and get very more curious about it. And, and, uh, and so I, uh, I was like, talking to Michael, and I'm like, you know, hey, I want to somehow be involved, maybe help with casting or something. Da, 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 this. 
And then I was like also a little nervous, you know, because the elephant in the room is like it's it's a native story and and written by someone who's who's not native. And I was like, all right, uh, I want to be involved in this so that we can do this right. And Michael was so open and 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 he's one of the smartest people that I know. And he's the history and the everything that he's put into this script is is incredible. But I think the thing missing was engaging with direct descendants of the Modoc and engaging with the, with, with, uh, with people who, you know, it's more about the oral history, not just, you know, what, um, European or, you know, uh, you know, yeah, people have, have written about the written about the Modoc war. So I think it was, it was exciting that through my connections that I have from, from Ashland, Oregon, the, my, my dear uh, friends, the Florendos out there, I was able to, we were able to connect with, uh, with Chiwa James, with Taylor Tupper, uh, Debbie Riddle, and, and it was amazing. And, and the connections kept leading to more connections. And then having them on set, we had Taylor Tupper and Debbie Riddle on set. So that was just so exciting to be part of. And I'm, I, I was just so grateful to be part of the project. And, and uh, yeah, I'm really proud of what we did. Sorry, that was a really long answer of... How I got involved with the project, but uh, but yes, that is it. <laughs> Theo and Maddie, you want to add anything to that or not? Uh, yeah, go, cool, Madeline. Okay, um, I have been. I became really great friends with Michael during college, and um, before the world went virtual for us, I do remember uh, we were in a screenwriting class together to write our senior thesis projects, and I remember when Michael came up with. Um, the idea that he wanted to make his thesis about the Modoc War. And he wrote his first script. And me and Theo were actually some of the first people to read it. Uh, we were outside of our classroom, outside on the benches. Um, I believe I read the action lines and Theo read the dialogue. Um, and right off the bat, I, off the first read, it was, um, you could recognize that it was something really special um, and something that uh, I recognized I really wanted to be a part of. Um, the way that Michael writes is just really captivating and the way he tells this story, I think is really genuine and the research that he put into it is just kind of astounding. Um, I can agree with Roman and saying that Michael is, uh, a genius. <laughs> um, and so I just immediately knew that, um, I wanted to make this project with some of the people that I call, um, my dearest friends and I'm just really proud to be a part of it. Um, and for me, I guess I, I'm from Brazil and I moved out here uh, for college and Michael was one of my first friends from my first class here. And uh, we made a couple of like little shorts in the, our freshman year or whatever. And um, he also told me about this idea he had for a movie and he, it was about the Modoc War. And he explained to me, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. But anyway, um, that like the first year and the, you know, the future years we, we ended up being roommates and all that and I was like damn this guy is really good at what he does and I was and I, I was like it's really fun making movies with him so I just want to I mean whatever comes I'll do it so whenever we read this is their land and you know we got picked and we were like oh he was like oh yeah I'm making this I'm like oh shit I want to be a part of it uh so yeah so Hollywood, and since you are all film students, uh, I assume you're, you're all looking at this as a career path. Hollywood has a long history of um, having Native American characters and a long history of all of them being caricatures or cliches. I think we could all count on our hands how many films have really, um, probably starting with Dances with Wolves, and then that was sort of the watershed moment that sort of changed the perception of, let's not just present Na Native Americans as uh, you know the you know coming coming after the the cowboys, but uh, to actually showcase them as people. And your film, along with only a couple of other films that that immediately come to mind, um, take that one step further of presenting Native Americans in native language, uh, which I'm sure created its its own little issues in, in production, but how important was it to you that in the course of this film that you're showcasing uh, the Modocs as they were in the 1870s and speaking in their, their native tongue? Um, 
if you don't mind, Michael, I might take this one. Um, I got some stuff to add probably, but you for sure. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And uh, so this was an interesting thing that, that we all talked about because, you know, one, we're a student film, right? So we were like, what can we do realistically? But then also I was like, you know what? We, we, we can raise the money. We can, we can figure this out. And, uh, and one of the things I was really trying to push for was if it is a MODOK uh, from the MODOK perspective, why not have it in their language? And, uh, and so it was one of those moments where we're like, cool, that's a great idea. How in the world are you going to do that? Um, and, and we, we befriended um, through my, some of my connections, uh, Joseph Dupree, amazing um just addition to our film and really transformed it into now we're talking about language revitalization now we're talking about so much more than than uh than what you know what a student film can be it it, it, it felt so much bigger than than everything and then to have uh Taylor Tupper and Debbie on set and for them to be like I know I I understand that like and and for them to feel so seen it was so exciting for me and uh, but it's also a really, you know, complex journey of having that because the actors had to learn this really quickly. Joseph was coaching them on Zoom and he was on set and to have him on set was amazing. So it it meant so much to me because because um, language re revitalization for Native communities is is such a huge um subject right now and for for a long time and i think right now is an exciting time like the new movie prey and uh we have we have so many uh shows now that they're really trying to honor the the traditional language and trying to see it how much power that has because when that language is spoken then it's 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 alive it's it's here and telling people that that um and, and it's, it's not just seeing it through an, a eurocentric um, mindset of just English, right? So, uh, I I really am proud of that that work that we all did on that. Uh, Michael, you wanna? Yeah, so I've got a few things to add. You know, like Ramon was, uh, he brought this idea to the table a little bit because I, you know, in my study, I'm like, I'm like, well, language isn't spoken that much anymore, and, and that's very true. Joseph is one of the few people with with very extensive, you know, knowledge of this language, um, and. Uh, you know, Ramon brought this idea and I'm like, okay, we have to find a way to balance this out. We, I, we wanted to make it work. And I was like, you know, I was like, well, you'll, you'll notice in the scenes where there are also characters from the United States, the MODOK also speak English in real life. They wouldn't have um, very few of the MODOK spoke English this time, but it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't want to take away from our protagonists in scenes where other characters are speaking English. So you'll notice there is a very clear distinction here of, when we're scenes with just all MODOK, everyone is speaking the language. When there's scenes with a mix, we keep all English here. Um, I never want to take words out of the protagonist's mouth. Um, but I also wanted to kind of touch on another important part of your question there, Kurt, which was like, how important was it to present the MODOK as they were in 1870? And that was really important to me. Um, a lot of the times you talk about stuff where, you know, like you said, a lot of Native characters, they're in you know leathers they're you know all, all these kind of costumes that are maybe appropriate to some tribes and certain areas of the country but not as a generalization which has been used here and the modoc you know they wore the same things the settlers did i mean this is 1872 they've they've adopted some level of culture and there's been an exchange already so you know we have the modoc in jackets and things that people don't tend to picture native characters wearing. Um, and I always thought, you know, like I wanted to kind of portray them in this moment, right? You know, one of the most interesting things to them about the Modoc to me is they go through all the kind of worst parts of colonization in a really short period of time. I mean, the US shows up in the Klamath Basin really late and 45 plus years later, the Modoc are being moved to Oklahoma after this war. So, you know, I thought it was an interesting thing to try and capture them very specifically in this moment. The, uh, the production for, for this, you know, it's not something that you necessarily had to shoot on location where 
this actual event happened. But I know that was a very uh, strong part of your overall efforts in pre-production and, and during the production to want to do this either on site or as close as possible to where all of this happened. And then the authenticity factor that you were just talking about in terms of language and costuming to be as close as possible to getting it right to what actually happened. Um, but Hollywood sometimes, you know, prefers to dramatize right, right, rather than showcase, you know, the, the reality of, of a situation. They start with the foundation of fact and then turn to uh, making it as entertaining as possible. So how important was it to maintain true to life and filming on location as much as or as close as possible uh, for this film? Can I, can I start real quick, Michael? Um, I, to me, in the beginning, like we, like Michael would always say, like he really wanted to be really like accurate to historical events, which was which became important to all of us, in my opinion. Um, and you know, sometimes the professors wouldn't even understand why they would try to change it our ways, but we were like, no, we want to make sure it's it's the right way. You know, is we're gonna do it there, like. Uh, and, you know, it made the production, the pre-production so much harder because we had to take everyone up there, the whole crew, the cast, find a place for them to stay and find food for everyone. And it just, you know, it was an effort. It was it was an effort that was really hard. But I think what happened was when we went to our scout with everyone, uh, because, you know, Michael was probably the only one who had been there before. And once we went to our scout, we saw the land and we felt it and it was just like yeah we have to shoot here like nowhere is gonna be the same as as it is here and i think we all just fell in love with it and wanted to just you know make sure that it was there because it would just make the film so much more special 100 percent. and i think like something that michael would say was that always hit me was that and and you know i talk about this a lot and especially when you make uh you know, native centered films is the land is a character. That land is so important to the story. Um, and and to, and to, when we went up there to the lava beds, it was like, yes, if you shot it somewhere else, it's not going to have the same impact as to right here, because that the the caves, the lava beds, it's it adds so much to everything. So I'm, I'm very grateful we got to do it up there. And it was it was amazing. I think to add to that, um, the, the title of the film, um, which we went back and forth on a lot with the title, especially with our, our professors and the rest of our crew, um, the title of the film is called This Is Their Land. And as Roman said, the, the land itself is almost a character. It's it's the most important part of the film. It's it's the, the entire plot of the film is about the land. Um, so to even think that we could shoot it anywhere other than the place where it really happened just didn't really make a lot of sense to us. Um, there was a lot of like practicality reasons that we're, we were fighting with to be able to get up there. But uh, overall, I think we're all really grateful that we got to shoot up there. Yeah. And Kurt, I know you probably want to move on here, but my quick thing, and you're totally welcome to cut this out, is, um, you know, this is this is also a case of me being a bit of a brat here. Like I, I did like people would be like, what if we shot over here? And I would be like, no, we're not going to shoot there. And here's why. And what it really came down to is, you know, you talk about Hollywood has a tendency to dramatize. There is one other kind of feature film about the Modoc War made in, I don't know, 54 or something called Drumbeat. Um, and they shot in Sedona. Um, and you can tell the filmmakers literally had never come up here. Not once. Um, because they have the whole sequences of all the battles that are taking place in open air on the rocks. And I'm like, how do you think the Modoc won this war? They won it because they knew the land. They knew this kind of how to fight guerrilla against a much larger force. And part of it is this land was so unique to them. They had come to this land to defend themselves for hundreds of years. You know, this isn't this isn't a place they're forced to. They know every single piece of it. And you kind of just can't find a landscape quite so volcanic and quite so varied anywhere else across California, at least, you know. So trying to shoot in Southern California was kind of like, I was always like, I don't think it's going to happen, guys. 
keep finding a way to make it work up here. The production itself, uh, I mean, we all know how difficult it is to make a film to begin with, but then you throw into the uh, additional factor of trying to film in the middle of a global pandemic and all the added restrictions that come with that. Uh, and then uh, I do recall the very first day of filming, we had a freak snowstorm that hit uh, in, in late, late April that, that, of course, you do all sorts of planning and all sorts of preparation and match out schedules. And then something like that hits and basically throw the whole schedule out the window. And let's just figure out what can we actually shoot right now? Um, so I'm, I'm curi curious to hear about your experiences with the actual production, with all of the added factors that had to come into play with just being able to shoot on this location that, that was very difficult to get to, having to relocate so many people, having to adhere to COVID restrictions to be able to operate, and then having odd factors that are well beyond your control, like, oh, hey, all of a sudden there's snow on the ground everywhere, so we can't really do any <laughs> exterior shots. You know, luckily that storm hit on the on the one on the two. Well, there was a there was a lot of snow on the first two days of our shoot, which was the two days that we were shooting in the caves. So luckily, we didn't really have to worry about it too much, except for the people who were at base camp, which was like outside. And I was I was one I was there too, and there was yeah, yeah. where like I was the only person there with like I think Michael's dad and um and the wardrobe uh people and this wind and snow just came and took all of our all of our tents away and we had like this background guy like try, uh, trying clothes on because he was going to be in, in the shoe like a few days later and uh, and it was just like the, the the tent moved and he and it was really cold and the guy was like naked in there trying to put on some clothes <laughs> and it was a nightmare to fi to fix it back but it was it was really really funny but yeah yeah it, you know Kurt you know we're a soon film and I'll keep saying that and then literally every time we talked about what our film is going to have we just checked every box of the biggest nose you know like don't do this we had horses we had guns we shot 12 hours away from our school we we did everything that our professors taught us not to do for a senior thesis film and we proved that we could do it and i think that was really exciting but i will say when we shot it that week hats off to madeline theo like it was insane like we probably got at most like for those five days probably 10 hours of sleep over those five days it was insane and then the snow and then the insane heat and dust storms and yeah i feel like i feel like um uh, the lava beds really threw everything at us. It was, it was, uh, it was, it, but it was so much fun and everyone was so game, you know, shout out to our crew who were not paid to, uh, you know, come up with us. We're all students. So we're doing this for free. It was, it was a journey and, um, but it was so amazing. Like we had such an amazing time and, and that crew, like we hold so dearly, like it was, we, we became a family that, um, that week. Yeah, and I mean, well, Kurt, I think you said, you know, if you don't like the weather here, just wait five minutes. And that was <laughs> that was pretty true. So true. Uh, you know, we, we knew there was going to be snow the first day. And I was like, cool, I've booked a day that's completely in the caves, right? And I was like, we're going to just shoot in the caves. We're going to find a way to make it work. And, you know, for the most part, it's pretty hard to tell in our movie that it was snowing for two days of the shoot. Um in the sequence where Jack is talking to Wynema in the cave that has a skylight, if you're paying really close attention, you're going to see snow coming through. But other than that, you really don't. Um, we we kind of, you know, managed to shoot around it. But that first day, um, we finished the shoot. And on the way back to all of our hotels, uh, <laughs> it became full snowstorm. So it was like the day while we're shooting, everyone's like, oh, it's fine. It's not that bad. It's almost kind of nice, except for Theo at base camp. And then on the way back, everybody's driving, and it is just a flurry of snow coming straight at our windshields. Yeah, it was – the first day was a little crazy. <laughs> and then and then cut to the last day where it was so hot that I got this awful mask tan. So, like, it was so sunny, and I – like, this part of my face was pale, and this part was just so dark. 
It was so funny. It was just, it was an amazing week. We, uh, uh, we had a second film crew that was also in Klamath that exact same week up from Los Angeles as well to also film a short film in Klamath Falls. And uh, so as the film liaison office, I was bouncing between both your set and their set to, just to make sure that things are okay, if there's anything that you need last minute to help out with. And it was was comical how both sets were, were like uh, dealing with the, the exact same thing. Freak snowstorm completely throws a wrench in all of our plans. And then, oh my God, it is so hot. And it is so, so brutal. How do we shoot around this? It's like, welcome to Klamath. Oh yeah. <laughs> This, this, what, well, well, you said you wanted to shoot on site. This is the realities of, of shooting off location when you don't have a sound stage to work with. So, um, I, I'm I'm curious to know what uh, because authenticity was such an important part of this film, and trying to get as close to reality as possible for telling a a historic story. What do you hope that audiences take away from watching this film? Mm. Someone start this. I think. Okay. I will give my my little bit. I always built this film in this idea of like I think I had kind of mentioned earlier of I wanted people to leave not thinking of this as solely like a massacre perpetrated for nothing but evil means, but as this very equal exchange of you know, kind of injustices being done from both sides to each other that leads to this moment. So I always kind of wanted, I feel like partially because as Roman kind of talked about, European scholars kind of write the history of America. There isn't a lot of moments where we get to peek into how native people thought about the things that were happening to them. So I always wanted this to kind of be a narrative that would devilify these Modoc leaders to these people who, you know, European scholars who for years have said, you know, oh, the Modoc are the most savage. They they did these horrible things. And it's like, absolutely not, right? Like at the same time, you know, I think I I think I jokingly said this, but I, I sat down with somebody who was local up here at one point, and they were like, I wanted to tell you that the Modoc, you know, they were violent. And I'm like, Yes, but also they took all the Modoc horses right before the massacre. And I'm like, if I went on your land right now and I stole your horse, what would you do to me? And he's like, well, I'd probably shoot you in the back. I'm like, thank you. That is the answer here, <laughs> right? Like, sometimes that is, you know, part of the story is like, it's not just a senseless act of violence. It is these compounding things that make something that on the surface looks incredibly violent, really make a lot of sense and become this kind of, I mean, because it is the end of the film here, you know, it is this kind of catharsis to a long and kind of complicated process. It becomes the only solution. And I kind of wanted to see how that plays out. For me, a big thing that, um, that we all wanted um, to, to do was to get this story out there in the first place. Um, there's a lot of native stories um, that you hear about, and by a lot, I, I don't mean a lot. Um, we're not taught very extensively about Native culture, um, which we should be. And uh, if, I, I don't know another person that knew of this story before before we told it. Um, and I think it's a really important story to tell. It's um, the only time that a general was killed in a Native conflict, which is just a really huge deal. Um, and their whole the whole culture of this tribe and the history of what happened with the Americans is just really something that I think deserves to be told. I think people need to know about it. I think people should know the history of what happened on that land. And I think that a lot of people can really learn from this story as well. Yeah, Madeline actually touched on a thing there that, that I would like to come back to. You know, this might end up getting talked about in the Modoc Nation documentary since I haven't seen it. Charlie, when we had last talked, was like, it's not done yet. Um, but, um, you know, this war, I mean, Technically speaking, it is the most expensive war in United States history, considering time fought. The U.S. put in an insane amount of money for 1870 into housing all these soldiers on land that they couldn't really house them on and trying to make this all happen. And, you know, it, it's, it's a huge army. It's 400 soldiers 
plus organ volunteers up against really about somewhere between 50 to 70 Modoc who can fight. I mean, really, it, it's it's a bloodbath waiting to happen in a lot of moments. And at the same time, when you look at those numbers, for them to just, for the United States to just get a reservation for the Modoc where they're asking for it, it costs them $20,000 in 1873 US dollars. On the other hand, they spend 400000 So this isn't, you know, the U.S. isn't like, oh, they're asking for something unreasonable. The U.S. was trying to make a point. Like, a lot of Native tribes were rebelling. They were fighting against these things they were being told they had to do. And the Modoc were an example. You know, to the U.S., this was like, we're going to shut this down so hard that every other tribe in the Northwest is never going to try this again. And I think, you know, it is important to acknowledge that the U.S. did this a lot. They committed a lot of Native genocide over and over. And sometimes they just tried to sweep it under the rug as if stories like this didn't happen. We talk about, you know, we talk about Little Bighorn a lot because it's a narrative that the U.S. likes to talk about. And I don't think they like to talk about this as much because it's very complicated and it doesn't make them look very good. Mm-hmm. I, I, I will add to that. I think it's just absolutely disgusting that I didn't learn this in school. I grew up in California, in Southern California, and we're not ever even addressed this. And there's so many more stories like that just in California. And for schools to not be teaching this, and it, it's it's ridiculous. And I think if anything, I, I I think that's a big part of why I love this film was because it sheds light on indigenous history and indigenous, um, well, yeah, indigenous history here, just where we grew up. You know, it's not like I, I it's not, you know, even just across the country. This is so close to where, where, where we grew up. And we never talked about this in schools. And I think that's just insane. And so um, I think there's so many things I want people to take from this film. There's so many things. I think the biggest is, is how important language revitalization is. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about indigenous history. Let's talk about how to, how to make films about indigenous and native um stories engaging with direct descendants engaging with the tribe i think is so important and uh and yeah there's just so much and and i'm just i'm grateful i want people to see it and i want um i also want to shout out that that we had um uh some native people in our crew too and i want to talk about the importance of having representation not only on the screen but behind the camera and like one of our associate producers isaac uh, isaac michael Ibarra, he, you know, he was huge, you know, having him, um, he's, he's Tongva. And so having, um, having that representation behind the camera is important. And yeah, I just, I think there's so much more that we can do um, to, to acknowledge the atrocities that this nation, this great nation is built on. So um, yeah, some more stories need to be told. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that that's that as we're talking about this comes back to me, you know, like something I really want people to take out of here is like there's a whole story going under here about Ben Wright. And um, Ben Wright is definitely a part that, you know, even I think locals don't know quite as much about. And, you know, there's this thing that, you know, California paid Indian hunters by the scalp to clear out this territory before they become a state, you know, and Ben Wright is notorious for this. And in this moment where there's been, you know, there's been some settlers killed somewhere near Bloody Point, a bunch of settlers are riled up by Ben Wright to go and get revenge. And Ben Wright does it without any mercy and without any consideration. I mean, he kills women, children, and, you know, Jack tells that story in here. He says, you know, they, you know, 45 of us are called out under this white flag. He, he's waving a white flag, the symbol that the Modoc have been told are peace. And then he just fires out from under the poncho. They ambush everyone and they kill everyone. 
And when he comes back to Wairika, he's celebrated with a giant dance and he doesn't tell anyone that the scalps are children's scalps hanging from his belt. And not only do they do that, but as, as Wainema says in this movie, they made Ben Wright the Indian agent of the entire Northwest Territory like four years later. I mean, a brutal guy who massacred children is put in charge of the people he massacres because that was the image they wanted. And I think, you know, when we're talking about any of these Native and U.S. relations, a lot of it is these kind of ghosts of the past, right? Is General Canby and and Alfred Meacham, are they potentially good people who are trying to help the Modoc? Yes, maybe. But it's not going to erase in their memories all of the injustices that have been done to them before. How can they trust Canby and the government when the government at one point was Ben Wright? You know, I think there is an, a, an overwhelming theme in this movie of, you know, injustices and then the the mistrust that fosters from all the things that happen to you over time, you know? Well, it's an interesting film in being able to spark a dialogue and we will be able to have that dialogue at the 10th annual Klamath Independent Film Festival when this film, This Is Their Land, is partnered with a documentary called Modoc Nation. We will have a special panel discussion. Hopefully some of you will be able to participate in that. Uh, so thank you, Michael, Madeline, Theo, and Roman for being here. And to your entire crew, thank you for taking the extra measure of wanting to come film in the Klamath Basin. We always appreciate when, when people want to come here and make a film on site. Um, and thank you to our audience that has been watching this. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed This Is Their Land. It will be screened on Saturday, September 17th at 2.15 p.m. in our Southern Shorts category and available on demand through the end of September.